Hey, I'm Pusher, and this is another Music Minute Breakdown, where we analyze a song to see how music works. And today we're looking at la di da di da di da di deo by Bill Wirtz. Bill Wirtz is a unique musician who is mostly known for his YouTube and Vine videos, which blend aspects of pop, jazz, comedy, and dense video editing. You may be familiar with him from his History of Japan video, or the history of the entire world, I guess, where in a short time he narrates through extremely fast-paced summaries of history. He used to make videos for Vine, so he has lots and lots of short pieces of music, lasting only a few seconds or so. He also also has a selection of more typical three to four minute pop songs. They all share his distinctive brand of aesthetic, lyrical, and musical themes. After years of him making this kind of content, he's been finding a lot of success recently on YouTube, with some of his videos even reaching as high as the number one trending spot. This is due not only to the quality of his work, but also the consistency of his vision throughout the work. So da -dee -da -dee -da -dee -da -dee -da is a recent song of his, and today we're going to be looking at some of the musical devices that make it work. But there's a much broader theme to this video, and that's self-actualization which is fulfilling your potential given your specific set of talents. It's definitely not always easy to go your own way and make something that's never been made before, let alone find commercial success at it. But Bill Wirtz has done just that, and just by analyzing his music we can learn a lot about how he's done that. So that's going to be the biggest question I'm going to be exploring in this breakdown, and the one that I personally went into this analysis hoping to answer for myself. So let's start with the global information. It's in 4-4, it's in G major, it's 104 BPM, it's 82 bars long, acts of 26, 27, and 29 bars, and it runs 3 minutes and 11 seconds. Next up is the instrumentation. Here's a list of all the instruments that happen in the song, that I could hear anyway. There's a fairly standard vocal arrangement. You've got the lead vocal, as well as harmonies and doubles, which creates three different tiers to the vocals for different sections, or for emphasis on some lines. You've got some very sparse effects throughout the song, mostly for weirdness or sonic interest. Express the things I feel just to express the things I feel. You've got a pretty large selection of leads in the song. The only song that we've looked at so far with so many leads was Michael Jackson's PYT, which of course came out in 1983. And I'll talk about this more later, but that actually kind of speaks to part of how Bill Wirtz distinguishes himself from other musicians. One of the leads is of course the keyboard that he plays for the solo. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you that in popular music right now, solos have kind of fallen out of practice. Da -dee -da -dee -da -dee -da. five different chord sounds, mostly used as arrangement layers to differentiate different sections. There is one bass sound, which is the live electric bass that he plays throughout the song. And I kind of get the impression that almost every sound in the song has been played live by Bill Wirtz. And then you've got assorted drum kit sounds. And the rhythms used in the drum kit are a little more nuanced than you would get in a normal pop song. To me, it sounds like a jazz drummer playing a pop song in a jazz way. And I'm sure that just speaks more to Bill Wirtz's personal experience. And it's just another part of his own personal character that he brings to his music. So is there anything in the instrumentation that makes the song especially Wurtzian. Definitely the rhythm section is part of it. The chords, the bass, and the drums, as far as I can tell, are all played live. Which, for music that you find on the internet, is kind of unusual given the prevalence of DAWs and MIDI quantization, and soft synths and samplers. It's really easy for somebody who doesn't have too much musical experience to make a song that is technically perfect. And even though there are lots of people that can produce music, or play music, there are not nearly as many people that can do both competently. Which, for Bill Wurtz's fans, I think is one of the things that adds value, that he can actually play all of these parts live. The instrumentation also seems to harken back to an older age of songwriting. Not just the live parts, but also the abundance of lead sounds that fill in space between the vocals. And I know that we talked about this in the PYT video, but lead counter melodies that contrast against the vocals aren't near as popular anymore as, say, sound design or effects that fill up that space. The other big thing about the instrumentation you don't necessarily get from just looking at this list, and that's the specific sound design of many of these sounds, which almost reference an early days of the internet kind of sound. There are little sounds reminiscent of ringtones, Press the thing. I feel just to express the things I feel or startup sounds cuz I'm just too small and these almost lo-fi digital synth sounds
and at a time where music production strives to be as crisp and as clean and as tight and as loud as possible, this sound design is not really like that at all. Instead, just going for something entirely different. Maybe just by virtue of the fact that he's playing these parts and producing the song himself, putting it up on YouTube, and finding fairly significant commercial success. He's speaking to this sort of DIY post-internet art generation of people who are familiar with and kind of over this meaningless shock value of internet weirdness, and want something that embraces some of the weirdness that came out of the internet, but has a little bit more substance behind it moving forward. Now let's look at the form of the song. Typical three-act form. Act one has an intro, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, and a two-bar break. Act two has a verse, pre-chorus, chorus, and a solo. In act one, the verse, pre-chorus, and chorus are eight bars. In act two, the verse is six bars, the pre-chorus is four bars, and the chorus again is eight bars. You've got a one bar break at the end of it, where in act one, we had a two bar break instead. And then we've got an eight bar solo. Act three starts out by mirroring act two with a six bar verse, a four bar pre-chorus, and then when we get to the last chorus of the song, they change a little bit. So chorus 3.1 is seven bars long, and the last two bars have been cut down so it gets into the last chorus more quickly. And I'm using a few different devices he made it sound natural. And then chorus 3.2 is eight bars long. We then get some more of that internet weirdness in the outro where it totally breaks from the rest of the song into this sort of non sequitur weirdness. Just got home, got no home. La -di -da -di -di, where did it go? Oh no, I can't go home. So the interesting thing here is how the verses, pre-choruses, and choruses have all been sort of changed in the different sections. How he's made these parallel sections different lengths while still making them feel natural. So that if you're listening to it without seriously analyzing it, you probably would never even notice. Now let's look at the melody and chords of the song. The verse chord progression couldn't be much more standard. It just repeats a G, C, D, C, or one, four, five, four. And the melody mostly sits on the tonic G, occasionally being contrasted by a D and an E below it. I don't have enough time to say the thing I wanna say to do the things I wanna do or to be like you. I just want some time to express the things I feel, just to express the things I feel and believe them too. The first half of the first pre chorus starts out the same way as the verse one, four, five, four. And in the second half, it moves to alternating between A minor and C, or the two and the four chord. It does this twice, but the second time it steps up using a G over B chord. And then in the last bar, we get this suspended dominant chord, C over D which sets us up to go back to the tonic chord at the start of the chorus. The melody in the pre-chorus starts out by sitting mostly on a D, where in the verse we had mostly eighths and sixteenths, we're now doing mostly quarters, where in the verse the melody sat mostly on the tonic pedal point, in the pre-chorus we sit mostly on the dominant. Now remember the dominant's job is to lead to the tonic, and so having a pedal point on the dominant creates a sort of growing sense of anticipation. In the second half of the pre-chorus, the melody moves around a little bit more reaching from as low as the dominant to as high as the median. And this sets up a melodic contrast from what's happened so far, moving into the chorus, which is much more melodic. Two plus two has been four, four. So many darn years, oh Lord. I wanna write a song. Oh, baby, is that just so wrong? The chord progression in the chorus starts out G, A minor, C, D, which it does twice. Then we have a very interesting and deceptive thing that happens. When we get to the second half of the chorus, it starts on a G with the same melody that we've had so far, but that only lasts two beats before we break completely. And we start this ascending chord progression, C, D, B over D sharp, which is an implied dominant leading to E minor, the relative minor. We then do an A over C sharp, which is another implied dominant that leads us again to our suspended dominant chord, C over D, to create a sense of tension that helps us conclude the section by landing on a G. What's really interesting here is that the C in the first bar of this progression is made to feel like a downbeat or beat one, even though it happens on the third beat, so that when you're counting along it's difficult to feel the natural meter, and instead it feels like a new bar is started in the middle of a bar, and it feels totally natural, and there are a lot of factors contributing to how it feels natural. <laughs> The 
In the arrangement, he has lots of instruments land at the same time. He breaks up the melody so it sounds like it's starting a new phrase. He breaks up the repeating chord progression that we've seen by landing on a C, the subdominant, which feels like the start of a new progression. And these are the same techniques that he's going to use later in the song to make sections that are different lengths from the average eight bars feel natural even though they may only be four or six or seven or nine or ten bars long. At the end of the chorus, we have a two bar break that mostly follows this long descending keyboard line. When back home Now verse 2 is only 6 bars long. It's really similar to the first verse in the chords and the melody. I went down to the mall then they closed down the mall cuz they don't want me going to the mall cuz I'm just too small. Then I built some trains and I'm traveling somewhere new. It's a wonderful world but still no you. So how does he make this feel natural? The arrangement of the pre-chorus is much bigger. He's introducing more instruments on the downbeat of the pre-chorus so that when it happens, it feels very much like you've arrived in a new section. Looking at the second pre-chorus, you can see that it's only half the length of the first pre-chorus. It's four bars instead of eight. So the chords in the first two bars of the pre-chorus are G, C, D, C, which is what the first four bars in the first pre-chorus do. And the chords in the second two bars are A minor, C, and then ending on the C over D, the D9 sus, which is the chord progression borrowed from the second half of the first pre-chorus. So if you think of the first pre-chorus as two different groups of four, he's basically taken half of each of those groups of four and put those together to make a second shorter pre-chorus. Wonderful world, but still no you. But of course, the big question here is why would you want to make your section shorter? Can't a section just be eight bars long and that's fine and it can just repeat every time it happens exactly the way it was? Sure, you could do that. Lots of people do that. Pretty much all pop music does that. Every song that we've looked at so far except PYT does that. But by cutting the sections down in length, we get to the chorus faster and it increases the intensity moving into the chorus. So without loads of risers and effects, you can use just the writing and arrangement to increase intensity naturally in the structure of the music. Second chorus is the same as the first chorus. The only difference is the length of the break after the chorus. The chords in the solo are the same as the chords in the chorus, and the melody notes of the solo are mostly diatonic. In fact, they're mostly pentatonic. In Act 3, the verse and the pre-chorus are the same as what we had in Act 2. Same chords, same melody. Chorus 3.1 is interesting. It's only seven bars long instead of the eight that we've had in the previous choruses. And he does that basically by taking the last two bars and condensing them into one bar. He's arguably dropped out the A over C sharp chord and gone straight from the E minor to the D9 sus or the C over D, which is of course the dominant sound that's going to take us back to the start of the next chorus. By taking away the A over C sharp chord, it feels like less of a tension and we sort of just gloss over it. So it doesn't feel like the end of a section. It feels like we're gonna keep rolling, which we do when we do a second chorus right after it. So what he's doing is he's keeping up the momentum between the two choruses that happen side by side. And then the last chorus is the same as the first two. Same melody, same chords. <laughs> At the end, we've got about three bars of this non sequitur that steps outside the key and completely breaks from the rest of the song. Just got home, got no home. La -di -da -di -di, where did it go? Oh no, I can't go home. Which is, of course, one of the things that Bill Words does that makes him unique. Now I want to talk about some of my big takeaways, the things I learned from analyzing this song. First off, the specific musical takeaways. The fluid lengths of sections, especially the constantly changing lengths of the verses, pre-choruses, and choruses, and the way he uses writing and arrangement to create a synthetic downbeat in a place other than beat one. I said this in the PYT video about them using the exact same trick to change section lengths, but it's really interesting and I think it makes the music more engaging, and of course less formulaic. The specific sound design is interesting. It's not really following trends. Instead, the sounds are almost analog, like he's using a freeware synth or maybe some old keyboard from the 80s. While most people seek to be relevant by following trends and using the latest technologies so that the music sounds recent, Bill Wirtz has just kind of not done that. While his music is fresh and different and new, it's not because he follows trends. It's because he just picks and chooses from whatever he likes to make something different. And you don't always have to be using the latest technology to do something different. One specific thing I'll say about his mixing is that the vocals are always very dry and very upfront. The 
most important thing clearly is the lyrics of the song. And it's supported by lots of interesting musical stuff, but the focus is the vocals and you can never lose the vocals in the mix to other aspects. I don't typically talk about lyrics, but the lyrics in Bill Wirtz's stuff are unique. They're clearly a little bit ludicrous. It's hard to tell if they're subversive or meaningless, but I think that kind of mirrors reality in a way. I went down to the mall, then they closed down. Anyway, the fact that the vocals are super weird and that they're very upfront in the mix definitely contributes to the overall appeal of this fairly unconventional music. There is an aspect of this weirdness and absurdism in the music itself, of course. The sound off the intro. The non sequitur outro. Just got home. Got no home. La -di -da -di -di, where did it go? Oh no. I can't go home. The obviously deep musical experience in the solo. Some of the fills. I wanna write a song. And even the section lengths, though you wouldn't notice it. But then for creatives, there are some life takeaways that you can get from this song as well. The biggest being self-actualization. People often talk a lot about not following trends and being true to yourself, but still somehow most music ends up falling prey to these massive musical trends. And honestly, it's hard to blame people because you can make lots of money and it's pretty easy. But to look at something that's actually truly unique, that comes from a person who's just doing whatever he wants to do and not following trends, I feel like that's more what people are talking about when they say be yourself. And it's definitely not easy. And that of course opens up the question of why you're making music. And honestly, music takes all kinds, but that's definitely a question that's worth thinking about in your creative career. Whether you're a musician or a creative or maybe selling shower curtain rings, who are you doing this for? It seems to me like Bill Wirtz is making music for himself. But no matter what your personal goals, you can learn something from it. If you were to look at one still from a Bill Wirtz video or listen to one second of his music, if you've ever seen anything of his before, you're probably going to be able to identify it as his pretty quickly. And that's something that we can all learn for our work, is to have a clear identity in what you make. I really can't stress that enough in any style of music or in any creative endeavor. Knowing what you're about and having a strong identity is probably the most important thing because it underpins everything that you do. Anyway, that's been your Music Minute Breakdown of la di da di da di da di deo by Bill Wirtz. You can help support the creation of these videos on Patreon. I'll put the link to the original song in the description. You can help spread the word by sharing this video with anyone who might learn something from it or anybody who won't learn something from it but loves to complain about being bored all the time. Or if you've got some suggestions for the next song that I should analyze, you can drop those down there as well. You can find me on all the social media. I think that's it. Did I forget anything? I guess let me know if I forgot anything. Anyway, until next time, I'm Pusher. Thanks for watching. Oh hi, thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage.